Welcome back to The Place We Find Ourselves. I'm Adam Young, and today I am joined by Christy Bauman. Christy is a therapist, she's a professor, and she's the co-creator, along with her husband Andrew, of a phenomenal short film called A Brave Lament. In today's episode, Christy and I talk about uh, a lot of things, but one of the main questions we address is, what does it mean to enter the wounded places in one another's hearts? And can goodness really come from places of wounding, from places of death? Those are some of the topics we cover today. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, we are back. Welcome to the podcast. We've got Christy Bauman on the line. Hi, Christy. Hi, good to be here. It's good to see you. Uh, Our listeners might know your name because uh, I've done an episode with your husband, Andrew, about this film that the two of you did together named A Brave Lament. And I was wondering if you could just uh, tell our listeners a little bit about um, how that film came to be. What was uh, what was happening for you that you decided we need to put this stuff on film? Sure. So um, neither Andrew nor I are filmmakers by trade. Um, we're therapists, and professors, and parents. And I have been uh, mostly pregnant for the last six years of my life. And in that process, um, have endured through a stillbirth to life children and then two miscarriages and actually a third child six weeks ago. So uh, we, we have our third little boy here. And in that process, there were um, so many times where I felt like my body was having to hold on to something that I couldn't talk about and I had to be silent with. And it was during our second miscarriage that I turned to Andrew and just said, I need to make a film. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I I need to make a film about this process because it is such a silenced place for me. And I don't think that's okay. I think that too many people are bearing this in their own bodies and not having a place to speak about it or not having a voice in this um, process. So uh, he said, okay, I called a friend who's a filmmaker and got some money and, and started the process of marking, uh, the pregnancies and the different outcomes that I had in in my story. And and the theme of marking, uh, kind of runs throughout the film. Um, and we're going to return to it, but to begin with, I just wanted to start with a portion at the beginning where you're, you're teaching and you're talking about a difficult time that you're having with this husband and wife. Can you tell that story again? Yes. So I was a therapist on the oncology unit in a hospital for about two years during an internship. And I worked with women who had mastectomies, double mastectomies, and a husband and wife had come in after over 20 years of being married. And the wife was in the healing process of having a mastectomy just the month before. And the husband goes on to explain to me that he is not only not attracted to his wife's scars and his, her missing breasts, but he also is, he, he can't, um, be turned on or engage her really in intimacy. And I was at a loss in that moment and went back to my supervisor and said, what do I do with this? Um, and I even had my own doubt. I, I, the scars, um, when a woman's chest is removed, um, when her breast is removed from her chest is pretty, it's pretty incredibly hard to look at. Uh, and we see a marring and it's, it's hard for us as humans to hold that. But my professor, professor and supervisor says to me at the time, Dr. Tina Sellers, she says to enter the wounded place, to enter the scar is the most intimate place you can, you can engage and enter. And I believed her when she said that, and that was a big part of it. And I, I went back and, um, was able to sit with that couple and teach in a way how we can enter the wounded place and how we can enter scars. And when we look at our own bodies and we see marks and scars where we have story, 
where our skin was cut open um, or harmed or damaged and then repaired itself and it left a mark. And if you touch those places, even though the feeling is probably limited, when you allow someone else to touch that place, there's a vulnerability that awakens our brains and our bodies in a way that I really can't even describe. And that was the concept that I was then trying to convey to this couple in that process. Right. And so it sounds like the invitation of your professor in that moment was this couple can actually experience a deeper intimacy by looking at and sitting with and touching the scars, the wounds. Yes. And if you look at neurobiology, the depressing part is we can, if we look at rats in a rat lab, we can see that the dopamine doesn't get higher after a rat has been introduced to the same rat. Until it sees a new partner, that dopamine doesn't spike. Now, that's pretty depressing for the domesticated person who is in a monogamous relationship until you see that dopamine spikes whenever we engage in some kind of dangerous act together. And we see that light up in the brain when we touch someone's scars, when they are, when there's a vulnerability there. So part of my process was when I lost my first son, having sex with my husband was really hard after because pleasure did not make sense in the place where death had passed through. And I had to engage in my mind. How do I make sense of having sex or engaging in pleasure, letting my husband enter into me in a place where death had passed through me. The concept of that was, was so hard for me. And yet it was such an invitation for intimacy. It was such an invitation where I tell you when I felt known by letting myself be touched where I was scarred. Yes. And there's, so there's just this embodiment is so deep. There is correlations everywhere in this that I think sometimes in Western culture, we just, we look past, we don't think about it. And yet when we slow ourselves down and we enter into those places, there is so much waiting for us there. So much. So, uh, you, um, you're diving right in here. Uh, and this is... (laughs) I mean, what you just said is really, and we're going to come back to it at the end, but I I can't not comment on it, that the place of pleasure and the place Mm. of death, when those are the same place, Mm. yeah. And it is for all of us in some ways. I mean, yes, in my story, it was that I birthed a child that was not breathing, right? I birthed death. But all of us know that at some level, we know what it means to try to create something and give ourselves to something and death to be the outcome. And so the bravery it takes for us to then engage it again in a place of pleasure, to let someone touch that place or be with us in that place is, um, it is sacred. It is holy. We are going to come back to this, but I want to, I want to meander a little bit. After you share with your class that the most incredible intimacy is when we enter the wounded place, you you go on to sh- speak about how you're working to help people find their voice and use their voice. So let's talk about uh, about voice for a minute. Part of your impetus for filming was you were being silenced. Exactly. There yeah. was something big happening in you and there were no words for it. Mm-hmm. And something in you rose up and said, no. Mm-hmm. Speak a little bit about what do you mean when you say helping someone find their voice? Each individual person, I have not met one person who I don't find myself so curious to know the nuances of their voice, meaning who they are, where they come from, how their story has impacted them, and how they choose to live in this world prior to where they've been marked. So I listen with such a curiosity when I listen. And I had to learn how to do that with my own voice first. Mm. And that invitation came when I endured suffering or joy, and I didn't know how to speak to it or articulate it or share it. We use one test, the ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experience Survey. 
And the number one thing that tells us if children are successful in the world is if they can articulate, if they have words to explain how they feel. Well, a child is not, doesn't come across that without being helped. And that's the process I find myself elated by is clients who come in or students who come in and they don't know the sound of their voice. They don't know what they think. They don't know what they feel. They don't know where they've come from and the invitation to learn that. But first I had to say where I came from, what I felt, what I thought, and where it really sparked was when I was carrying children within me. The crazy part about pregnancy is you have no control and you have a lot of control. You can't eat certain things and yet you have no power over whether you'll go to the bathroom and there'll be blood and you will have loss to encounter. And that can happen at any day, at any hour, and you don't know. And that's crazy making when I had to internalize that. But as soon as I could give voice to it, all of a sudden I realized that there was an entire gender that was engaged in that same process and didn't want to be silenced either in that. And that's how I started my journey. I started speaking up. I, I have women say now, like, you never go on Facebook and put that you just had a miscarriage. You weren't allowed to say that, but you could say that you were having a baby or so there was suffering is when we start to silence. We don't allow people to share that as openly and that's a great place to start speaking and using and finding your voice. And in fact, in the film, uh, what you say is the only way I've learned to step into my own voice is to hold and face my own tragedy and my own grief. So you're linking facing the reality of the harm that you're enduring with finding your voice. It's a great connection you make in that because it's very true. And again, when we don't ever ask why and if something was worth it, like I would never really say my suffering was worth what came from it. But my voice came from living through my suffering and putting words to it. And I was freed in that process because I was able to speak. And I can live freely because I can speak about the pain or the death that I have birthed and buried. And I can speak about the life um, that I have birthed and that I get to engage. But because I get to speak freely, I am free. And there's something about the threat of miscarriage where mm -hmm. I, th the way you put it in the film is this. You say the fear of being mocked has come up. So you're carrying life and the fear of being mocked comes up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How is it that you find yourself warring with the threat, the, really the daily threat of the mockery of evil when you have mm -hmm. something living growing in you that may not be living tomorrow? The futility that you could be doing all the right things and not produce or not have a living baby at the end of the story can make someone insane. So in that moment, we're invited to hope and we're invited to dance, knowing that at any point weeping could come. And we could either call that being mocked and being made a fool of, or we can call that our bravest moment. And for me, I, I had to figure that out that standing there with this protruding belly of life, that it could also in the next moment hold death. And that's just parenting. That happens even outside of the womb. And what does this mean for people who aren't carrying a baby? What does this mean for somebody who's carrying the hope of something else? Because the threat of, um, of killing hope is always there. Yeah. And the threat of being mocked as a fool for hoping that you would get married or hoping that you would conceive or hoping that you would get a job or, or hoping that let's just be even hoping that when your husband comes home from work today, there is a gleam in his eye. And if there is not, you know something of death. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It, it, it's so true. And it is everywhere. And I, I like to call it. um death with a capital D or death with a lowercase D. And 
we all know death with a lowercase d. We all know those small moments. And I also call birth with a capital B and birth with a lowercase b. And that is what I've had to engage when I am trying to get my kids out of the door and I'm frustrated and I'm trying to birth something. I'm trying to birth movement. I'm trying to birth life, family, get your shoes on. And I am so frustrated and I'm I'm not present with the fact that I actually have children who are alive in front of me and I am so grateful to be with them. So what am I, what am I birthing in that moment? Yes, it's with a lowercase B, but I am birthing, um, the fullness of life being alive, breathing in that moment, because I don't know that I'll be breathing the next moment or the next day. We just don't know that. And so there's a call to live fully alive. But there's a cost, like you said. And so what's going to happen? There is a cost to your hope that your husband comes home and will look at you with delight and want to care for you. And the cost is, is that you may have to grieve that he doesn't. Right. And that's all the time, every day. And so what you're really talking about is how do you hold death and resurrection at the same time? You can birth the hope and the desire that when my loved one comes home, when my partner comes home, I actually want to see delight in their eyes. Or you can kill that and just say, I'm going to focus on something else because it would be too painful to hold that hope. And that's really what I'm hearing you talk about in the film, in your words now, is how to hold both of those and how to live alive given the reality of the possibility of deep disappointment at any moment. I can remember Easter morning, the first Easter morning after I lost my son Brave, and I went to the grave, and I could not go to church that day because in some, there's this part of me that thought my son is going to be confused that I'm rejoicing in the resurrection when he is still in the ground. That pull is in me every day. It's what you're talking about. It's that pull to, like you said, marry death and resurrection in the same beat. I am waiting in expectation to meet my son again. And I am every day with my children getting to know them and getting to be with them. And that will always coexist inside of me. And to the degree that you're longing to be reunited with brave and your delight in the children you have to the degree that you are both, you are alive to both of those desires. Evil has lost today. And I am no longer known as a woman who's been mocked by death, but I'm known as a brave, fully living woman. We're jumping around, but I want to jump to another place. Um, Okay. And uh, it's, it's actually going back to where we started about entering the wound entering the scar and and what you say in the film is i come to you with a body that's broken a body that's scarred and what does it mean to enter the scar that is the sacred place there is a scar there is brokenness and will will you let your loved one your friend will you let another enter that scar? And what does that even mean? The question there is, in some ways, a woman's body when she births is broken. And that's what I meant in that statement. My body has been broken, torn open to birth, life and death, both. And that process is my experience. But when I allow somebody to come into it with me, then I'm not so alone. Whereas if I have to carry that experience alone all the time, then I miss out on the, the redemption that's in that, the, the, the process of, of care and kindness. I don't think I was meant to carry that story by myself. And, and so, again, we come upon this question of will you speak? And in the speaking, there is a reaching. And in the reaching, there is the hope that you will not be alone in this heartache. Um, The story that keeps coming to mind, so I'll just dive in, is when our son was born, our son Brave, 
he had um, the cord wrapped around him four times and wasn't breathing and they couldn't give him to me right away. And one of my dear friends, Alyssa, was there and she held him. And I can't explain to you my gratitude to this friend to this day, six, seven years later, for holding my child when I couldn't hold him. Mm -hmm. And we were able to keep our son for 12 hours because we had people flying in and we wanted them to meet our child before we buried him. And those 12 hours, we had friends coming and taking turns holding him. Now, this may seem really strange, the invitation to hold a child that's not living. And it is a very awkward and painful and excruciating invitation. And yet I will tell you, I know each person who held him. And I know that my love for them and my gratitude for them is deeper than I could explain to you. And I know that their love for me and their gratitude for my son and their love for my son. And people kept telling us, thank you for letting us into this place. Thank you for letting us into that hospital room and hold your son. Why would you do that? Why did we have at least 25 people hold him? It really doesn't make sense. And yet I needed, I need those 25 people to have held him because it's crazy making if it was only I that held him. And so that's what I mean about that vulnerability of invitation. Like I, I can't explain to you the healing that happens when I can look at a friend next to me and say, but do you remember his face? Do you remember what, how heavy he felt so big and so grown and that kind of invitation, that kind of intimacy into that wounded, scary place that to me is the story that came up when you asked about what does it mean to invite someone else into that sacred place? You needed someone else to hold the death that you had been holding and could not hold right now. Yes. Yes. And, and though that story is unique to my story, I think that's true with all people. Our bodies, our scars hold stories and when we invite someone to touch them, to know them for one moment, we are less alone with that story. And when we share that, that bond is healing and it is intimate and it's powerful. And that's what I mean by sacred. It's just, there's a power in it that is not tangible. There's a bond that is not breakable. It's on a holy sacred level. What comes up to me is just the laughter of the mockery of evil, that when something so dark, you know, a scarred a place on, our ch on a woman's chest where there used to be beauty and there is now a scar that looks violent, when that place becomes a moment of deeper intimacy with her husband, then evil really has been mocked. I mean, there is laughter echoing through the universe. And when your friend held your dead son that you could not hold, they were bearing something of your torment. And it, it, it created life in the midst of death. What do you do with that? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not explainable. And it's not explainable. You know it. I know it even now as I talk about it, um, as I see them holding that, you know, as you as in my mind's eye, seeing that husband come to his wife and trace her chest and trace that scar where there was once something of great beauty. And now he's trying to move towards and understand what it means to be cut open, to be taken from. Oh, it is. It, it is a sacred, holy, powerful place. And it, and it does. It mocks the death because it, it brings life in that moment, in that touch. As the film continues, I hear you saying, I love to listen to my voice now. <laughs> I just loved it when you said that. You say, I love to listen to my voice now. Before, it was quiet and uncertain and shaky. And now it just feels like that's the best me. And at the end of the day, I love this sentence, at the end of the day, I rest because it's a good voice. 
but it's taken a lot to name it good. Can you say some about how is it that you came to a place of rest that it's a good voice? It's that moment when you finally turn and you see that inner child. When I saw that young six-year-old girl in me and I watched her and I was enamored by her and I loved her. Um, or when I looked in my mind's eye and saw the 60, 70 year old me wise and brilliant and beautiful. And I was in awe of her. I had to come to peace with who I used to be and who I am to become. And that is a process of integrating my story. And it just wasn't integrated prior. It was choppy and there were parts that were off limits and silenced. And I had to take the ugly, dark parts and kiss them. And I had to take the beautiful, brilliant ones and kiss them and both take just as much courage. Um, it's, it takes courage for me to actually say how good I am for fear of being mocked for fear of the moment when I am no longer good or not good enough or not as good as someone else. And yet when I really look at her, all of her and all that she's lived through, I am, I'm just amazed. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that she still breathes and lives and speaks. Right. And so really the experience is as you look at the six-year-old, you have awe. Mm -hmm. And, and as you look at the woman who has just birthed death, mm -hmm. you have awe. I do. I do. I actually spoke out loud through the birth. And I knew I wanted to do this before I knew that Brave was dead. I thought, I'm going to talk to him through the birth, like coach him. Like, I'm going to be that mother who says, you can do this, sweetie. You can, you can do this. And the scariest moment was when I realized that he wasn't with us. And I still had the choice to do that. And I did. I said, sweetie, you can do this. Whether I was coaching him through death or coaching myself through that birth and the birthing of death, I realized my voice. I wanted to hear my voice and I wanted to cheer myself on. But you bring it, you, you bring it up now because you're naming what you're in awe of. You're in awe that you made that choice. I am. I really am. At the end of the film... You're sitting around the table with friends in your backyard. Uh, you are there with friends that have walked through this with you. And uh, I, I don't know if it's you or Andrew who says, I want us to celebrate more and to mark celebration more. And in, in many ways, the film is an invitation to intentionally celebrate and to intentionally grieve and wail. I mean, it's an invitation to be fully alive full bore, full stretch. So curiously, this is what most of us did naturally as very young children. We had awe and wonder when something good happened and we cried when something bad happened. What might it look like to, in day-to-day -day life to heed your invitation to celebrate more and to mark it? What does that look like for you as a mother with three little ones running crazy in the house to celebrate more and, and to market? It's as simple as making every little mundane thing exciting because it is. And, and we mark a lot with, with food. Um, we celebrate our kids a lot with food. I mean, uh, or yesterday, um, my three and a half year old was brave cause she stayed at, um, camp when she didn't want to. And so when she came home, we had happened to find a $10 bike. And so we gave her a bike and we went and rode that bike for the next two hours and cheered behind her on her training wheels. And you, you'd see me right carrying this six week old in the front of my pocket of my shirt and, and holding onto this bike. And you see my husband and my five-year-old son running behind the bike, cheering her on. And that is our normal day. And so it reminds me what you're saying right now is, 
it reminds me of something in, at the end of the film where you say the hardest thing after you bury something is just to have pleasure. To be naive again, to dance again, to sing again. And, and that is true. I, I remember my birthday after losing Brave and I had sparklers in my cake and I was, I just started crying and I said, I want to grab all these sparklers and I want to dance through this field. But I'm so afraid that all of you watching will say, shouldn't she still be grieving? And I would be judged and I'm scared to be judged and I'm scared that I'll dance and I won't feel as alive as I once felt when I was naive. And I took those sparklers off the cake and I just ran through the field and danced as a 33 year old woman. And I just tried. I wanted to just try to dance. And, and if you can do that in that moment, th then the resurrection is real. If you risk dancing again after you have known death, then there's no longer anything abstract about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and if you risk singing again after you've, after you've known death, then evil has not stolen your voice. If you risk being naive again after you've known death, e evil has not killed your innocence. And if you risk dancing again, then evil has not destroyed your ability to experience pleasure. In my mind, that's what the film is inviting us. It's so provocative. It's inviting us. It's daring us to not only take our deaths seriously, but to find our voice in the midst of those deaths and to sing again and to dance mm -hmm. again. It's just such a gift to watch you uh, in this film go through that process. I mean, you bear witness to, I mean, the whole film is like, it's like watching the death and resurrection of Jesus played out in a community. Hmm. Wow. It's just, that's just what happens. It's not that you directed it that way. That's the whole point. It just happened. I honestly believe that in suffering, that's how we're called to respond so that we can experience the resurrection play out. I didn't know that would happen. I didn't know. I didn't know I'd be able to even try to have kids after burying a child. I, I, I couldn't even conceive that process. And yet somehow in being as broken and grieving as loudly and in community, there came a new life. There came a new, a new, a new, um, bravery to try. I don't, I don't even know where it came from. And, and I love your sentence. I didn't know it would happen. I mean, theologically, we know there's resurrection, but Walter Brueggemann says it so well. Whenever there is a newness of life, it is always a surprise. And, 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 and that's what I'm hearing you say. It was like, oh my gosh, this is a surprising new place that I am suddenly in. And I have no idea how I got here. And I was following no formula. I was just being, uh, what I would say is two words. You were being honest and you had immense courage. But it's not rocket science. It is simply honesty and courage. And then taking the risk of will you let other people decide if they want to participate in that with you. And if I, what I remember from Andrew's portion in the film, some people did and some people did not. And little did we know or could we have even explained we were inviting to engage in the resurrection. We, we, didn't, we couldn't have even known. We thought we were just inviting you to engage in death with us and in grief. We, didn't, we, we had no idea the beauty that would come from it. No idea. Well, Christy, it has been such an honor to see your face and hear your voice. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Christy. Mm, appreciate it. 